Non Hello everyone, welcome, good morning uh, for this session on conservation and alteration of heritage materials. Our first invited speaker today is Letizia Monico uh, from the CNR in Italy and she will talk to us about mostly synchrotron xenes to probe the degradation of artist pigment. Letizia, the floor is so good morning to everyone. First uh, of all, I would like to thank to the organizer and Marin Cott for inviting me to this workshop. So as a continuation of what uh, Kun Janssen talked yesterday, today I will give you more detail about what can be the advantages and disadvantages in using different 2D science based approach to study the degradation mechanism of uh, artist pigments. We know that there are color change in several paintings that occurs as a consequence of the chemical alteration of different kinds of inorganic pigments. Among these, there are classes of red pigments that show that are the causes of strong discoloration in uh, paintings. One example is the darkening of red vermilion. Another one is the fading of red lead. Among the blue pigments, we know that there are several classes of pigments that tends to fade. Among these compounds, we can uh, found the smalt, that is a potash glass with cobalt uh, ions, and Prussian blue. Regarding the yellow pigments, we know that there are several types of yellow pigments that tend to change color. One of these is the classes of the cadmium sulfate-based pigments, known as cadmium yellows, that was found uh, in several artworks uh, of uh, impressionist and post-impressionist painters. And according to previous studies, mm, researchers found that this type of compounds tends to fade. Among the yellow pigments, we know that there are also other compounds that belong to the class of the chromate-based pigments that tends to darken. We can uh, observe in several uh, paintings by Van Gogh and other uh, impressionist painters like uh, Serot that zinc yellow and the chrome yellow show a clear darkening in specific areas of the paintings. So from the, the uh, analytical uh, point of view, what is uh, our approach for starting to study the reasons that are behind this uh, chemical alteration? First of all, uh, it's really re it's highly relevant to know what is the composition in altered and uh, when possible, an altered region of the paintings by studying uh, what is the, what is the uh, distribution at the surface uh, of the painting itself uh, and what is the distribution of different uh, chemical compounds within the layers of microsamples. For doing this kind of analysis, considering that paintings are complex system because they are composed of uh, a lot of organic and inorganic material and considering uh, there are that can be considered dynamic system because uh, we have to consider that components inside the paint can interact each other and at the same time the paint can interact with different environmental agents like light, humidity and temperature. We need uh, to use uh, to gain as much as mo po much possible information, different type of um, analytical methods that allow us to obtain complementary information, and methods that can explore our system at different length scale, from the macro scale to the micro nano scale. The study of paintings, so by studying the paintings, we know what is the cur current state condition of the paintings, but we don't know the complete history of the paintings. So in order to understand what are the single steps which have led the paintings in the current condition, usually it's necessary to combine the study on original paintings with laboratory study. 
by analyze pigment and mock-up samples that has a composition as much similar as possible to the original paintings. Essentially, what we do in lab is to study uh, system at increasing complexity, starting from pigment powders that can be synthesized or that can arise from uh, uh, historical manufacturing procedures. And then we move to study simple pigment binder combination. And finally, in order to go closer to the original situation, we, go to we, we move to study historical paint tubes or more complex mock-up sample in which the pigment is mixed with other components. For evaluating how different environmental factors can affect the uh, current state condition of the paintings, what we do is also to perform artificial, artificial aging treatments for evaluating how, for example, light, humidity, moisture of a combination of them can influence the uh, materials. Of course, we have to evaluate that the uh, chemical transformation can be present as a layer or as grain that can archive values, th that can archive size of the, at the submicrometer scale. So today, what I will show you, I will focus in presenting how X-ray spectrum microscopy methods can be used for uh, studying this kind of processes. Of course, synchrotron radiation-based X-ray spectrum microscopy are useful for obtaining information about the chemical nature and distribution of different phases at the submicrometer scale. What we usually do is a combination of different X-ray spectroscopy. In particular, X-ray fluorescence, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, and X-ray diffraction. Today, I will mainly focus in the application of uh, Xane spectroscopy for evaluating uh, the alteration mechanism of different types of pigments. In particular, I will focus in uh, presenting you so to present you some results about the darkening of chrome yellow and additional results regarding the fading of cadmium yellow and Prussian blues. These three classes of pigments have in common the fact that the color change is due to redox processes that involve specific elements of the pigments. We, our results have been collected at three different uh, synchrotron radiation facilities, SRF, DAISY, and at the Australian synchrotron facilities. So, Regarding the experimental approaches that we have used, here you have an overview of the uh, experimental setup that we have used at ID21 beam line. Measurements have been performed in transmission mode by using a fulfilled sense imaging setup. And we have performed scanning X-ray fluorescence mode measurements by combining different approaches. Yesterday, Marin talked about uh, one of these, especially that uh, um, consists in the combination of the uh, acquisition of uh, 2D micro X-ray X -ray fluorescence maps at a number of selected energies, in combination with single point micro xane analysis in, uh, sele at selected spot of the paint. This first approach can be expanded if instead to collect a restricted number of energies, we collect a lot of images, X-ray fluorescence images at different energies, such as at the end we will obtain a stack of images that allows us to extract from this data set axane spectra for each pixel of our X-ray fluorescence image. This experimental setup, this kind of experiment can be, have been, da uh, been uh, done also at PO6 and X-ray fluorescence beam line by using uh, one of the last generation fast detector that is called Maya. 
if you want to have uh, some additional in technical information about uh, the beam line and how each single detector works, you can uh, uh, read this publication. So starting with the darkening of chrome yellows. From a chemistry point of view, chrome yellows belong to the class of blade chromate-based pigments. These pigments are known for, for their uh, uh, low photochemical stability over time. Here you have some examples that we had the opportunity to study where the chrome yellow is degraded, is altered. The analysis uh, on uh, original paintings uh, have been combined with studies on mockups uh, prepared with in-house uh, mm, synthesized chrome yellow powders containing a different amount of sulfur. You can clearly see that after photochemical aging, not all the chrome yellow varieties show the same uh, extent of darkening. Especially we have found that only those pigments containing a percentage of sulfate higher than the 50 percentage and that have an uh, orthorhombic structure show a clear discoloration after aging. What is interesting to know is the fact that the alteration, if you look to this image of uh, a cross section taken from these samples, is usually present as a very thin uh, very thin layer at the surface that is usually lower than uh, 10 micrometers. So what we have found while using Xane spectroscopy? Essentially, we could prove that this alteration is due to a photoreduction process of the original chromate to chromium 3 compounds. In addition, thanks to the uh, detailed study on mock-up paints, we could prove that there are several factors that uh, uh, trigger the uh, photochemical uh, reduction. In particular, the uh, process depends on the chromium sulfur stoichiometry, on the crystalline structure, and also depends on the nature of the binding medium. So why its, uh, it's uh, chromium K age Xane spectroscopy is useful? Here you have the Xane spectra collected from different uh, uh, chromium-based compounds that are different also in terms of oxidation states. You can clearly see that a pre-age peak, uh, intense pre-age peak, is present only on the chromium-6 compounds. Along with these differences in terms of intensity of pre-age peak, you can also see that with decreasing of the oxidation state, we also have a shift of the absorption age towards lower energies. However, so looking mainly to this difference, we can use uh, the reduction process just monitoring to the intensity of the Craig peak. By looking to this difference, we could properly select uh, energies for doing 2D micro X-ray fluorescence mapping experiment by selecting an energies in correspondence of the pre-age peak energies, where we assume to mainly excite the most oxidized spa chromium species, and another energies above the absorption age, where we assume to have to obtain mainly the X-ray fluorescence emission from all the chromium species. If you look to the, to the results, we can clearly see by looking to the chromium speciation map that in correspondence of the alteration layer, we clearly have mainly uh, the presence of reduced chromium. This, in combination with the single point Xane's measurements, is al also visible uh, from the spectral point of view, where before aging, you can clearly see a spectrum that resembles that of the lead chromate, while in correspondence of the alteration layer, we can clearly see strong differences that can be ascribable to the formation of reduced chromium. So a similar uh, situation has been found also in uh, one sample of similar composition to the mock-up samples taken from uh, an altered region of the sunflowers paintings, the Amsterdam version. You can clearly see that we have a similar distribution 
in terms of chromium reduced, both in the original paint microsamples and the mock-up samples. By crossing this information, we could clearly conclude that, reasonably conclude, that the presence of this species can be ascribed, is ascribable to a reduction and a degradation of the original chromate pigment. So we have also at the same time explored how we can use fast detector for studying uh, the problems of uh, degradation of chrome yellow pigment. So here you have an example, a, a, a sample taken from the bedroom of Van Gogh, uh, of the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And we can clearly see that we could clearly observe and map different chromium species, especially chromium-3 hydroxide compound and chromium-6, in this paint sample by using the Maya detector. You can clearly see that here we have a comparison of the 2D microxanes mapping with the two energy micro X-ray fluorescence mapping of a uh, region of the interest of the sample. And what we conclude uh, by looking also to this detail, that for sure we have some advantages and some disadvantages in using this kind of fast detectors. One is for sure the faster acquisition time, because here you have only a small region of interest, while here you can map in reasonable time the entire sample. The data set is more representative because, as I said before, we have larger areas of analysis, plus the fact that we have, for each pixel, one same spectra, while here we have only a few spectra at the selected point. The other advantage is the fact that we use usually lower fluence. That it means that we have the possibility to decrease the radiation damage to the sample. On the other hand, we have some disadvantages, such as uh, the lower spatial and spa spectral resolution with respect to this system, a stage platform that is less stable, and lower fluence that means also a lower uh, spectra of lower quality, where the signal to noise ratio is lower. So, as a last step, we also try to explore the possibility to apply the full since imaging in transmission mode to chrome yellow samples. We did some tests, uh, and in the end, uh, we could conclude uh, that this is, is very challenging as an experiment, or not possible, because uh, since we do measurement in transmission mode, uh, this kind of measurement requires uh, an ad hoc uh, sample preparation of thin section that is strongly depend so this kind of measurement, the successful of this kind of measurement, not only on the thickness of your samples, but also on the composition of the matrix. In our cases, our measurements have been complicated by the presence of lead and to the fact that the most light sensitive samples show also a concentration of chromium that is very low. However, so if is this true, what we have done is also to try to evaluate if it's possible to apply this kind of fulfilled full sense imaging in uh, chromate-based pigments of other composition, where, for example, lead is not present. So we did some uh, measurement on uh, a crota potassium chromate-based oil paints that you clearly see that show a uh, uh, reactivity that is very similar to that of the most light sensitive chrome yellow pigment and show a distribution in terms of degradation layer and yellow paint very similar to the samples that we have seen before. Okay, we don't have lead, we have potassium, we have chromium. What we can do with f the full field? Here the full field works very well. You can clearly see that in correspondence of the alteration layer, we could able to map the presence of different chromium reduced compounds, while in the yellow paint we can clearly see, also looking by the single point same spectra, mainly the presence of chromium-6 spaces. So what we can conclude that in this case, 
we don't have limitation in terms of matrix composition. And these uh, uh, results open also the possibility to evaluate maybe the, the um, application of this kind of investigation to other uh, chromate-based yellow that we know to be quite uh, uh, unstable, like for example the zinc yellow that have this composition where no lead is present. So, of course, before the analysis, it's very really relevant. Uh, we are using uh, uh, powerful sources with a NIG photon fluxes. So it's highly relevant to evaluate what uh, is the stability under the exposure to the X-ray beam of our system. For doing this, we did some tests on our mock-up paints of different composition. And we can clearly see that uh, at, uh, as a we can clearly see that in this case, we have uh, a regular spectrum of lead chromate. But what happened if we don't take care about the exposure time or of the fluence that uh, uh, arrive on our paint surface? Uh, sorry. So we can clearly see a strong damage of our paint that is visible clearly as a darkening. In addition, what is the problem? That the exposure to the uh, X-ray microbeam induces a similar uh, process to that we want to study, because we can clearly see that the, the prolonged exposure induced a clear reduction of the system, of uh, our system. So, this is means that it is highly relevant to take into account the factor before to start with our experiment. Here you have clearly the distribution of chromium tree species in correspondence of this damage. And by performing experiment on our system at increasing fluence values on these two systems, we can clearly see that uh, the X-ray radiation damage similar to what happened with the regular visible light, occur mo in a more pronounced way for the sulfate-rich form of the pigments. Previous investigation showed that next to the reduction of chromium, or the original chromate, we can clearly see also a decreasing and a loss of the crystalline structure. Loss of the crystalline structure that is more pronounced for the sulfur richest form of the pigments and for those phases that show an orthorhombic crystalline structure. We have also evaluated what happened in presence and uh, in absence of the binder and we can clearly see that the reactivity and the instability under the exposure to the X-ray beam is more pronounced when the pigment is mixed with oil. So it means that uh, when uh, you are approaching to do an experiment, it's relevant uh, not only to evaluate which kind of inorganic pigment you are studying, but also to prepare samples that are similar as much as possible to the painting that you want to study. Because you can clearly see that if you study only the powder, the system is more stable. So, Second uh, uh, case studies, the discoloration of cadmium yellows. Yesterday, we saw Kun Janssen talked about the study on original paintings. By combining the information arising from original paintings on a series of mock-ups, artificially aged mock-ups or different composition and crystalline structure, we could find, uh, uh, we could write a more complex processes, let's say, more complete processes, because we found uh, that essentially the oxidation process of the, sulf the original cadmium sulfide to cadmium sulfate that is responsible of the discoloration that we see on the painting is triggered by the presence of not only of light but also of moisture. Next to the presence of the sulfate, we could also found uh, additionally secondary products, including uh, different forms of hydrated cadmium sulfate 
zinc and cadmium oxalate uh, because uh, cadmium sulfide can be found also as can be found uh, also as a solid solution with zinc and other uh, chemical compounds mainly found in the original paintings so as an example i will show you how we can use uh, Xane spectroscopy for studying this kind of process and what can be the problem that we can uh, have. So Marine yesterday explained that sulfur cage Xane spectroscopy is a good spectroscopy for evaluating uh, and for monitoring uh, the mapping, uh, the distribution of different uh, sulfur species. Here you can clearly see in this uh, artificially OGED mockups that we have after artificially aging, the presence of sulfite as globulus inside the rich sulfide matrix. You can clearly see that this discrimination by a simple multiple energy to micro XRF maps is quite simple because the same spectra show clearly differences. Here you have mainly the sulfate excitation, here you have mainly the sulfide excitation. However, what happens if you want to gain, uh, obtain some information for regarding the cadmium speciation? Okay, here you have the Xenes reference spectra of some cadmium compounds at the cadmium LH. You can clearly see that the differences in this case are not so uh, clear like for the sulfur compounds meaning that uh, it becomes more challenging, especially when you are complex system like paintings, to select uh, proper energies for discriminating different cadmium compounds. So what can be the solution? The solution that we have found studying thin section, because you see that uh, we are working on things on section of five micro thickness that are quite uh, thin, uh, we could obtain clearly information by applying uh, full, full sense imaging. So you can clearly see that we could map the presence of different cadmium base phase, obtaining complementary information to the sulfur species analysis. Of course, this, if you, are if you are lucky, we can have even uh, more sensitive techniques for discriminating uh, the nature of this sulfate compound, like for example, micro X-ray diffraction. In these cases, we were quite lucky because we could clearly identify that these newly formed co sulfate compounds are crystalline and are present like a mixed sulfate in which you have not only cadmium but also potassium. So, as a last case of studying, I will uh, show you some uh, how we can uh, uh, use Xanes for studying the Prussian blue. So Prussian blue is a uh, class of pigments based on hydrated iron-3 hexachanoferrate 2 complexes. Here you have the chemical formula, formula and you have an uh, M where that can represent different kind of species. The blue, the intense blue color of this pigment is due to uh, uh, an intervalence uh, charge transfer between iron-2 and iron-3 ions, bridged by the CN ligands. In the literature, here you have uh, several references, it has been reported that the fading is due to a fatal redox processes that breaks the electron transfer between the iron-2 and the iron-3 bridged by the CN ligands. So in the context of our research activities, we had the opportunity to study a series of uh, Danish Golden Age paintings that show a clear discoloration. Here you have uh, an example. This is, is a painting that we had studied in collaboration with the Katz, uh, in particular, uh, I thanks David Booty that is conservation scientist there in Copenhagen, where uh, you can clearly see that there is a clear discoloration of the blue paint surface only on this region that were not covered by the frame. So we were interested essentially to try to reply to this question. 
can be this discoloration due to a iron 3, iron 2 reduction. However, this experiment, uh, we know, according to the previous literature, to studying uh, this uh, kind of process that can be, in principle, easily studied by using uh, uh, iron KH uh, Xane spectroscopy, show experimental challenges because we know that uh, Prussian blue is really sensitive toward the exposure to X-ray microbeams. And then we had the problem that we could not use, uh, for example, full, full Xane's imaging uh, spectroscopy because uh, the pigment is very diluted. So we have a very low iron concentration in a lead white Rix matrix. So we have a situation that is very similar to the chrome yellow sample that I showed you before. So we went to ID21. We studied a series of uh, resin embedded cross section, but taking into account this uh, challenging, this sensitivity, first of all, we did some experiment, uh, some test for evaluating uh, what is the stability of uh, Prussian blue under the exposure to the X-ray beam. By using an unfocused beam, so by using this range of fluence values, nothing happened. You can clearly see that the spectra remains the same. But what happened when we use a very microfocused beam that is the same that uh, we are usually used for studying microsamples? Okay, you can clearly see that the spectra, just after one acquisition, show clear show a clear changes. So these changes can be ascribed. So you, we can see, see the different changes. So the shift of the absorption age has been reported to be ascribed to a reduction of the original iron 3 to iron 2. In addition, we can clearly see that there is a decreasing of the white line along with an increase of the pre age peak that is attributable to a, an increasing of the disorder and the formation of the octahedral coordination sphere of the iron ions. So in this sense, uh, this experiment allowed us to define a threshold of the radiation, a, a, a radiation damage threshold. So for doing our experiment, uh, we kept the fluence values lower this uh, number reported here. These two energies have been taken uh, into account for performing 2D micro X-ray fluorescence mapping experiment at multiple energies. So we have expected to have here mainly the excitation of iron 2 plus ions, while here mainly the excitation of iron 3. Okay, here is the results obtained from our cross section. And we can clearly see, okay, good. We have already a good contrast, so it means that here we have mainly iron 2 in the discolored area, while here we have mainly iron 3, okay? In this, according to these uh, multiple energy maps. But what happened when we go to look to the exchange spectra? We have realized that actually this contrast is not due to a change of the oxidation state, but to a change of the phases that are present. Because at the surface, we have mainly iron-3 oxyhydroxide compounds, while here, as expected, we have mainly the integrated form of Prussian blue. This compound, uh, according to the literature, can be ascribed either to a deep natural fading of the Prussian blue, that after converting to iron-2, go again to iron-3 compounds, or to a residual of the manufacturing process. So, Essentially, this approach does not work very well. Oh my, I mean, work well in the sense that it suggests us that we have different iron phases. Actually, if you look to the spectra collected from different references compounds, we can clearly see that we are not so selective in exciting the iron 2 and iron 3 plus according to this energy, because in some cases you have a stronger absorption with respect to the conventional Prussian blue of iron-3 compounds. So what we did to overcome this problem? 
we try to perform, since we could not use uh, full field sense imaging, we did the micro sense mapping experiment. Well, the approach works very well because here you have immediately, by doing this experiment, after uh, uh, processing by linear combination fitting, we can clearly see the distribution of different phases that confirms also the single point sense analysis that we have done. Here we have mainly iron three, iron three uh, oxide oxide compound, while here you have mainly Prussian blue. So if you look to these values we have, and to these results, we have some advantages in, uses, in using this kind of approach because we have a more representative data set since we have uh, one same spectra for one pixel, lower fluence values, and uh, we, s we, we can clearly see that this kind of approach is also really suitable for thicker and diluted sample, we because we, didn't, we, didn't, we don't need to prepare thin section. We can work directly on a thick cross section. Of course, the disadvantage is the fact that we have uh, longer acquisition time. So we have every time find a good compromise in terms of map size, step size, exposure time, and spectral resolution. So by concluding, uh, we can say that the combined approach of uh, large 2D sense <coughs> imaging spectroscope, imaging uh, uh, experiment in transmission mode and uh, zoom in fan scale mapping in X-ray fluorescence mode is a valuable strategy for studying uh, uh, the alteration mechanism of from yellow pigments. Here, just to summarize, uh, I show you what can be the advantages and disadvantages in using full field sense imaging and multiple energy 2D micro X-ray fluorescent mapping in combination with single point micro sense. Essentially, what uh, I would like to, to conclude that as we seen for the Prussian blue in uh, for studying cultural heritage materials, the 2D microxanes mapping uh, approach in X-ray fluorescence mode is a good compromise, uh, especially because uh, next to the advantages to, mm, uh, uh, to reduce the probability of being damaged, uh, it allows also to uh, study any kind of samples regardless from the sample preparation in terms of thickness. So just to tell you that this can be a very valuable compromise because the full fit Xenis images sometimes work very well, but sometimes uh, it's very challenging, especially for uh, depending on the type of sample that you are analyzing. So I would like to thanks to all the institutes that are making possible the research and uh, all of you for your attention. Sorry for the delay. It's working? No. Uh. Okay, I just try. Oh, now it's working. Now it's just working. Thank you uh, for this very interesting and rich in information uh, presentation. Uh, what I found very interesting is also the damage studies you are doing, because that's of course not only important for the sample, but also for the results in the preparation itself. One of the findings you were showing that when the bromate pigment was uh, mixed with in oil, some more uh, uh, reduction. What are your thoughts about the explanation of this phenomena? So uh, one explanation, it can be for sure the fact that uh, according also to other studies that we have done, uh, when uh, you mix the pigment with the binder, you have uh, the, the degradation already started. So probably also the type of, uh, I mean, when you expose your organic matrix to, mm, to the X-ray beam, you have the formation of radical spaces radical spaces that uh, are very, uh, play a key role in the reduction process of the chromate. So one explanation can be related to the fact that next to the degradation of the pigment, uh, you induce 
also the formation of radicals of the organic materials that contribute to increase the reduction of the original chromate. So the, the organic matter is more a template for... Uh, exactly. Okay. It's a, it's a, a con additional uh, factor yeah. that contributes, next to also the presence or absence of oxygen yeah. and uh, the temperature yeah. as well. Rick? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for the very... Thank you. <laughs> Thank this one. Thank you for the very interesting talk. I don't think the microphone is uh, is working, but um, in the work that you've shown and in the reply that you just gave, as well in the in the work of uh, Claire Gervais or the work of uh, Lauriane Robinet that you've been uh, mentioning. Uh, there is a clear uh, effect, redox interaction between the uh, pigment grains yes. and the binder. Um, and uh, in when you look at the change of speciation uh, of the pigment, you're looking in a way just at one side, which is the uh, chemical reactions happening at the pigment level. How can you, what would be the ideas to know more about uh, the impact of the surrounding layers uh, and the effect of the matrix on all these mechanisms. Because if you look at smalt, for instance, or yeah, if you look at Prussian blue, um, the behavior and the composition of the matrix will, uh, will strongly influence those processes. Uh, so, so what would be the good way to progress to and progress to uh, know more about these interaction mechanisms involving the matrix? So uh, first of all, uh, the first approach should be to do systematic experiment on mockups that are close as much as possible to the paint that you want to study uh, by trying to change the composition. So, I mean, uh, for example, in the case of Prussian blue, our tests have been done in a mixture with lead white because uh, this is was the situation that we had in our painting samples. So another way to progress is to, based on the information that we have from the paintings to evaluate what can be the behavior in a systematic way in similar mock-ups under, uh, uh, under the, uh, on, uh, on similar mock-ups and under similar uh, ex um, exposure condition of your paintings, materials, and your mock-ups. Mm -hmm. That's my, uh, it's a systematic way to go on, but it's the only way that at the moment I see. And uh, to do this kind of test, every time that you start an experiment. Because even if it's published, okay, you have these values, but uh, I mean, when you work at different beam lines, okay, you know the fluxes, but sometimes uh, uh, it depends also, for example, if you, if you work in uh, environmental condition or in vacuum condition. This is, is a case that we observe, for example, by doing experiment at different uh, beam lines. So. The result that I showed you before was related to experiment that we did with an unfocused beam at ID26 in an environmental condition. So, okay, we started the experiment and we say, okay, here we don't have a focused beam, so we can be sure that nothing will happen. And at the end, we, we, we observe a big damage. And uh, by comparing the fluence values, for example, uh, that we recorded at ID21 when you work with the micro beam but uh, under vacuum condition, we realized that by using uh, similar fluence values at ID26, uh, we uh, observe damage while there no. So that's, uh, it's a very important uh, parameter to take into account and uh, one way to go on is also to do this kind of test every time that you start uh, your experiment. One final remark. If you define damage, yeah, because I can imagine also these vacuum conditions, is it the damage on the short term or also on the longer term? Because can I imagine that sometimes these damages just over months or years just yeah, are, uh, how do you approach that? Because also if you bring it to a bigger So in this case yeah. it's easy because the damage is there. Yeah. So then at the moment, we could, at least for the inorganic part, 
we could not see any kind of uh, changes, further changes, by looking to some model panes or what. Mm -hmm. But, but artificial uh, damages. Yeah, for the organic part, probably something's happened. I, know, I have to be <coughs> fair about this. Okay, thank you, Letitia, again. We can all thank Letitia. <laughs> Our next speaker is Eleanor Schofield from the Marie Rose Trust in Portsmouth, and she will discuss with us how synchrotron techniques can help us understand and preserve maritime heritage. Okay, is that working? Okay. Um, right, so good morning, everybody. First of all, thank you to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to talk um, and also for giving such great introductions yesterday to the techniques, many of which, most of which, I'm going to show in this talk because it means I can focus on the results and not how to do the experiments. Um, also, thanks to many of the speakers that have already gone um, because I'm going to try and touch on quite a lot of themes that have already been talked about, namely things like... Some of these techniques are really powerful, but you need to know what you're looking for. Um, also, they might tell you what is there, but not necessarily where it is. And that sometimes in sampling these things, you can mess with that. It might not be giving you a representation what is there in your th 3D matrix, whether that is a fossil, whether it's a painting, whether it's an archaeological object in this case. Um, and last of all, making sure that whatever we are doing is for the benefit of that collection, whether it's looking after it, whether it's telling that story. So my background is actually in material science and synchrotron science, and I find myself now working at the Mary Rose. Um, and so a big part of what I do is making sure what we're doing, even if it's many steps off and many years away, it is to look after that collection. Um, now, onto the collection. Can I just ask for a quick show of hands of who has heard of the Mary Rose before? That's good, because I'm going to give you a very short introduction so I can get onto the science. Um, so this was a ship of Henry VIII. It sailed for over 30 years before it tragically sank in 1545. The collection that we have is because it was preserved under the seabed for hundreds of years until it was found, and the remains that we have of the ship were excavated in 1982. Alongside that, we raised over 19,000 objects. There is a huge range of objects in terms of what they were used for, so we have very personal objects, we have everyday equipment, such as cooking items, things like that, and obviously weapons. Um, they really vary in terms of their size, how they're degraded, and also the different types of materials. So as a material scientist, this collection keeps me very busy. Um, so I first started working with the Mayrose when I was a researcher at the University of Kent. We were looking at the problem of sulphur in marine archaeological wood. We've heard a lot about sulphur already, the many different states that it can occupy, and how damaging it can be. Um, here you can see a chest panel and also on the right is where an iron bolt once was in a gun carriage and you can see there are all these salts which don't look very good but they're also very damaging. Now the wood itself, the, the ship is in very very good condition considering everything that it's been through but typically with these materials you do have to do some kind of consolidation treatment to compensate for the loss of the wood material. Um, in our case, we treated with polyethylene glycol, and once that treatment was finished, we then needed to, to dry it to remove any residual water. Now, obviously, the worry with that was we were then going to expose it to air, to oxygen, and we knew that sulphur was in the timbers and that this could transform and cause us problems. So we set up a program of work at Diamond Light Source at B18 using sulphur zanes to um, monitor what was happening as with to that sulphur as we were drying it. So the pictures here show you part of the ship and show you the kind of environment when the sprays were on and then when they were off. And then what I'm showing here is the sulfur zane. So you can see from this core sample that we've taken to the beam line, when the sprays were on, there was very little oxidized sulfur there. But then as we turn the sprays off, you get much more um, oxidized sulfur on the surface and it developing into the wood. We then came here to ID21 and we took those same core samples and took very thin sections of them to try and map what was there. So we had um, a couple of explanations yesterday about how you can XRF map at different energies to show you where the different oxidation states of sulfur are. So in here, the green on the, on the left is the, the surface before we started drying, and on the right is after we started drying. The green is the reduced sulfur, and the blue is the oxidized. So you can see straight away that there's much more oxidized sulfur. And then at the points indicated here, we've done zanes to work out exactly what is there. 
And by also measuring our standards, we can then do quantitative analysis to work out the different proportion of materials that are there. So this is all great. It's very informative. It's told me what is there, but I still don't really know where it is within the 3D structure. So this brought us back to the ESRF to ID15. First of all, what I'm showing here is tomography. So this is the absorption tomography. We look at this against fresh oak. So in the fresh oak, you can see the wood structure, you can see the vessels, you can see the growth rings. In the marrow samples near the surface, you can see that it's just a bit chaotic. That's because it's degraded. A lot of the, the wood structure um, has been compromised. But as you go down into the surface, you then start to regain some of that structure as the wood is less degraded. Now, what's fabulous about ID15 is that ev at every voxel within that tomograph, you can take PDF analysis. Now, PDF, very briefly, as opposed to XRD, is going to tell you about all the nanocrystalline and amorphous phases that are there. So what we're able to show here, this is a slice through a core sample. So on the left, you have everything that's there. What I really love about these images, too, is that you can see the growth rings. And you can also see that how either the plank or where we took the sample is obviously not straight on. It's slightly off. Um, and then you can isolate different phases. So what's great about this is it's telling you everything that's there. You just then have to find the match to what it is. So we knew that PEG was there. So sure enough, we can see it more near the surface and where the vessels are. We then found some really interesting things. So on the right hand side, we found these, this nano phase. This comes out as a, this matches with a zinc blend. So it's a zinc iron sulfur. You can see that they're not actually near the surface. They're kind of like a tear down. So perhaps they did form at the surface and they've been washed out. We're not sure, but this is really powerful at telling us what's there and where it is in the wood. Um, we actually have other phases as well, which we haven't managed to match to anything yet. So this is an ongoing process to understand what we're dealing with. Um, we talked yesterday about how it's very important to do your characterization before you come to the beamline, but the reverse is also true. So what we've learned at the beamline, we can then go back to the lab and think, right, well, how can we further our understanding with that? So this is one of the same core samples that we ran all these experiments on. But here we wanted to look at just benchtop XRF and also FTIR. So FTIR is really powerful with the wood because you can look where it's degraded, because you can distinguish the lignin from the hemicellulose and cellulose. And the latter two are the ones that degrade preferentially. So you see a much higher proportion of lignin where it's really degraded. And sure enough here, you can see the core at the top. You see where it's darker. This matches with where it's more degraded, where there's sulfur and iron, but also where there's zinc. So this is another kind of indicator that zinc is playing a role in this. So this took us back to the beam line. So as I was saying at the beginning, you need to know what you're looking for. So we had this program of years of work at Diamond looking at sulfur and iron. We weren't looking at zinc because we didn't know we needed to. Um, this is a kind of very rough and ready graph because we literally took this data a few weeks ago. Um, but you can already see all the different sets of data at different depths into the wood. And you can see that there's different phases there, so or different compounds there. So we will be doing some work now to try and work out what they are and where they came from. Um, we are also seeing some problems with sulfur in other materials. So we have thousands of bricks in our collection, which can often be quite surprising to people. But this was the ballast, but also made up the galley. So there were two galleys on board the ship. Um, and you can see the kind of salts that form, particularly when the artifacts are in high humidity. Um, and this e these are SEM images that we took. This properly was a moment where I had to forget being a scientist because when I first looked at these, I was like, wow, these images are beautiful. They're actually incredibly damaging for the material. So this is not good news, um, but they are beautiful images. Um, and you can see that there's sulfur and there's calcium and there's iron there. We have done some SEM EDS analysis. What's interesting is the conservation treatments that were done on these were cascade washing to get rid of sodium chloride because that was known to be there. Nothing was done for sulfur and iron and things like that because it wasn't known that they were there. And these treatments were done back in the kind of 70s, 80s. Um, I put a question mark as to what technique we'll do with it, but I know, we, so we did some lab XRD, but because there's so many different phases there, you didn't get the resolution to be able to deconvolute what was there. Um, so again, a few weeks ago, we went to I-11 at Diamond Light Source and did some um, diffraction there. And we're just figuring out at the moment, and I don't have the data yet to show you, but hopefully next time I see you all, I will. Um, just very briefly to mention the fact that some of the work that we do, and this is a project in its very early stages, is as much as we love beam time, it was touched, this was touched upon yesterday, is you don't always need to come to the synchrotron. Um, 
it's also very competitive as we know and you don't always have the people with the expertise at a museum I mean I happen to have a background in synchrotron science and I'm at the Mary Rose but it's not necessarily true that the Mary Rose would always have somebody with a synchrotron background um, and what we wanted to do I'd read some studies looking in environmental science where they'd use sulfur electrochemistry to detect um, sulfur in the different states of sulfur so what I'm showing here is how we, we use the synchrotron to analyse FES2 and then we made a pellet of wood to kind of mimic chemically the environment we have in the Mary Rose wood. And what we did was then look at the electrochemistry from that in solution and you can see a similar pattern here. So again, it's in very early stages, but the overall aim is that we would essentially have a system where you could do it in situ, you won't need to remove artifacts, it would be very straightforward and you would have an indicator of there being some problematic sulphur there. So, on to the Mary Rose Cannonball. So, marine archaeological iron is very complicated um, and can corrode very badly due to the chlorine from the salts that's there. This shows you how, how badly it can, ro can corrode. Some of them actually are in complete pieces. They literally just explode. Um, so, we've done a whole series of experiments over the last four years looking at different um, synchrotron techniques to understand the different conservation treatments that have been done. For example, we have XRF maps where we've taken sections of the shot and we've looked at where the chlorine is. Sometimes it will be scattered throughout at the surface. For some of the treatments, you'll see that you'll just get little inclusions inside. And when we look at the spectroscopy of that, you actually get different phases. So sometimes it's something called a kaganite, which is a very typical, very damaging corrosion product. In other cases, particular inclusions inside, you'll find that it's a precursor to that product and it will only form given to the right conditions, the right solutions, the right pH, things like that. We've also done, yes, it's working. Um, we've done tomography. This was at I-12 at Diamond. So first of all, just visually looking at this. So this is a segment about this big. Um, so the darker phases are the corrosion. You can see where the cracks are. You can see where the surface is. So this is obviously just showing you it as a whole. And then on the right-hand side, when that kicks in, you can see it layer by layer. So we can start to understand where the corrosion is. And then we can separate those phases so we can look where is the metal, where are the cracks, where are the corrosion, and how do they exist in relation to each other. And then the last experiment that we've been doing on the iron, this is on I-11 at Diamond. They have a back hutch, which is for long duration experiments. So we've been running this for well over a year. Here you see um, robotic arms, that, and there's a whole range of different experiments there, and they have every Monday blocked out that they will put each of those experiments in the beamline and run X-ray diffraction on them. So we set up an experiment where we were looking at marine archaeological iron, um, sorry, marine um, Mary Rose iron, some freshly excavated marine archaeological iron, some modern day equivalent iron, and also some synthetic acagonite. We put it into a solution which is typically used as a passive solution for looking after these kind of materials. And then every week we've been collecting diffraction patterns. And all of this data is being looked at now, but just to give you an idea of the kind of thing we can get from this, this is the freshly excavated iron, and the peak that's highlighted there is this, this very damaging pro product, a kaganite. So you can see over the hours, as it's exposed to this solution, how that starts to form. We can then do refinements on this data and look at the weight um, percentage of the different phases there, and you can see over time that you've got quite a lot of a kaganite, and then that does tailor off. It transforms into something else over time. And then very quickly, the last thing I wanted to mention is actually not, I haven't been involved in this research, but it's research that was done with um, a former colleague of mine. Um, all the people involved are at these institutes here. Um, and what they did was use the Xmas beamline here to do X-ray diffraction to look at some of the copper alloys, the brass links, and look how different conservation treatments had affected them. So in the, the bottom pattern, you see here that you get a signal, a, a peak not only from the brass but also from copper, so this shows that the surface has undergone some de -zincification. You can also see the one in the middle where it's much cleaner compared to the top one. The top one has much more corrosion products, so, and you can actually correlate this to the different treatments that were done to it, the different levels of cleaning um, that it underwent. So, I've mentioned lots of different projects there. It's involved so many different people at different institutes. I hope I've put them all on here. Um, and it, all of this is only possible because of their interest and their passion for our collection. Um, I can't give any talk without encouraging you all to come and visit our museum. We are not far from London. Um, thank you for your attention, and I hope to see you all at the museum soon.
thank you, Eleanor. Do we have some questions? Yes. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Coming from Sweden, of course, I'm interested in how this relates to the conservation problems of the Vasa, mm -hmm. where a very similar approach with polyethylene glycol was used, but uh, you have another runtime of about 20 more years, so you can see how the thing progresses. So, I mean, do you have some sort of like collaborative or uh, interactive thing with them? Very much so. So, yeah, they, they were a step ahead of us, and there's certainly things that we we learned when planning our conservation treatments. They, yeah. they had used different grades of PEG and they'd learned things about that, so we implemented that. And even to this day, we, we look at the, the, different, the different ways that things are changing and there's lots that we can collaborate on. There's ways in, w in the, by using the polyethylene glycol, there's ways in which that can affect the mechanical properties mm -hmm. of the wood and they're doing a lot of work on that and we're starting to now as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a very, very good partnership for us to have. <laughs> That's very nice here. Yeah. Just one other question. With, with the degradation of the wood, where's the zinc coming from that's causing you trouble? Is it leaching out of the brass items? Or it, it seems a rather odd sort of element to get turning up in this context. Doesn't it just? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think there's a variety of places that where it can come from. Um, you do have, um, so the same with the sulphur, you have bacteria that will interact with it in the seawater, mm -hmm. so that's a possibility. It's possible from the artefacts. Mm -hmm. What we're also looking into is everything that's been done to the ship and is around the ship, so the, the, the supports that it's on, the treatments that it's had, so we're really having to go through everything. Um, but that's what it, the, the recent analysis will help with. We'll be able to point exactly what compounds are there and then try and figure out where it came from. But yeah, it's an interesting find. Well, thanks very much. We have another question. Yes, already. <laughs> so, so I think you mentioned this PDF. Uh, activity at ID 15, I think it was. Uh -huh. So could you elaborate a little bit on, on some details and maybe on constraints you have to respect to use that method uh, in terms of how small or our big samples can be? And I'm not energy? entirely sure of the, si the size of the sample. We, we had very small samples, but I think there are, there are bigger samples that you can fit in there. I don't know if Marco is here actually from the beam line. I think maybe not. He would be able to answer your question much better than I can. Um, there's certainly long, it's, it's the age old thing of balancing the size of the sample, how long it will take um, and the resolution that you want to go for. Um, we, the, t the, the data that I showed, we were leaving those samples in for kind of half a day and you would be able to get that kind of five millimetre core and it was about five, ten millimetres in length. So that's the kind of acquisition time. But this is one of those things as well where you get huge amounts of data and it takes a very long time to go through because as opposed to the other techniques where it's very focused and you know what you're looking for, you're just getting everything. And then you have to start and go through and the, the, the um, research that was working on it so that you li just literally start it searching for things and it can search for days. You have to leave it. So it, it's, the, it's the, the post processing that can be the really time consuming part. Yeah, it always is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, just to answer the question about uh, how long it takes to make the measurement oh. and what resolution you can get. So they're related to each other. You have to scan the sample at the, at the at the resolution you want, so you use very small beams. So if you can go down to one micron, or even less than one micron resolution in your eventual voxels, you have to uh, scan uh, this many steps. So we do samples typically up to five millimeter, six millimeter diameters is feasible, but then with 10 or 20 micron resolution. So it depends how good a resolution you want as to how long you can do it in a reasonable amount of time, time scales of hours, let's say. Is that at this energy? Usually not rather high energy for various reasons. Uh, because uh, not have an absorption problem in the sample, and also you want to put the detector far away to 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 uh, for some other reason of uh, resolution. So what, 50, 100 kV? Normally, uh, 70, 100 kV. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We can all thank Eleanor again.